95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. If you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, so if you think about it, people wake up in the morning, uh, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits, of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now, how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being when they start their day is in the past. So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, by very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past. And for the most part, you're gonna keep creating the same life. So then people grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their texts, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, uh, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors. They get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, they see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and that becomes the routine, and it becomes like a program. So now they've lost their free will to a program, and there's no unseen hand doing it to them. So then a person can say with their 5% of their conscious mind, I want to be healthy, I want to be happy, I want to be free. But the body's on a whole different program. So then how do you begin to make those changes? Well, you have to get beyond the analytical mind because what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And that's where meditation comes in because you can teach people through practice how to change their brain waves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So. Um, most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis, you know, they wait for loss, uh, some tragedy to make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? And, and you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And I think right now, the cool thing is that people are waking up. What is that? Why do people find it so hard to get past trauma? Well, <clears throat> the, the stronger the emotional reaction you have to some experience in your life, the higher the emotional quotient, the more you pay attention to the cause. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly um, uh, emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so, when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called the mood. I say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago and I'm having one long emotional reaction. You say to the person, why are you this way? And they'll say, I am this way because of this event that happened to me 15 or 20 years ago. And what that means from a biological standpoint is that they haven't been able to change since that event. So then the emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. 
Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body's believing. It's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts, and they do, and then those thoughts create the same emotions, and those same emotions influence the same thoughts, now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past. The hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. Why does it feel so uncomfortable? Is it because of the, the, the neurons that fire together, wire together, so I've, there's like an easiness to that loop? Just because literally, and you've talked very eloquently about this, the way that the neurons connect in the brain, how rapidly, I've seen you show footage of how yeah. rapidly those connections happen, which is pretty incredible. Um, is, is that what makes it so discomforting for people? I think, that, I think that the bigger thing is that we, we keep firing and wiring those circuits, they become more hardwired. So there, you have a thought and then the program runs. But it's the emotion that follows the thought. If you have a, if you have a fearful thought, you're going to feel anxiety. The moment you feel anxiety, your brain's checking in with your body and saying, yeah, you're pretty anxious. So then you start thinking more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel. Well, the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind. Your body is your unconscious mind. In a sense, if you're sitting down and you start thinking about uh, some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind, and you begin to feel the emotion of that event, your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world, outer world, and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone. So most people then, they're, they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states. So when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it. But really the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master. And the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being the unknown, is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. People say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown, and I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? The act of rehearsing them mentally, closing your eyes, and rehearsing the action. The rehearsing the reaction of what you want? or the Yeah, action of the action want? of what you want. By closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing some action, if you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between what you're imaging and what you're experiencing in 3D world. So then you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now, your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows, you just may start acting like a happy person. And then I think the, the hardest part is to teach our body emotionally what the future will feel like ahead of the actual experience. So what does that mean? You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You can't wait for your wealth to feel abundant. You can't wait for your, your new relationship to feel love or uh, uh, your healing to feel whole. I mean, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect, you know, waiting for something outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. And when we feel better inside of us, we pay attention to whoever or whatever caused it. But what that means then is that from the Newtonian world is that most people spend their whole life living in lack, waiting for something to change out there. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. The moment you're empowered and feel it, you're beginning to step towards your success. The moment you start feeling whole, your healing begins. And when you love yourself and you love all of life, you'll create an equal. And now you're causing an effect. And I think that's the, the difference between living as a victim in your world saying, I am this way because of this person or that thing or this experience. They made me think and feel this way. When you switch that around, you become a creator of your world. And you start saying, my thinking and my feeling is changing an outcome in my life. And now, that's a whole different game, and we start believing more that we're creators of reality. If you're not being defined 
by a vision of the future, then you're left with the old memories of the past and you will be predictable in your life. And if you wake up in the morning and you're not being defined by a vision of the future, as you see the same people and you go to the same places and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's no longer that your personality is creating your personal reality. Now your personal reality is affecting or creating your personality. Your environment is really controlling how you think and feel unconsciously. Because every person, every thing, every place, every experience has a neurological network in your brain. Every experience that you have with every person produces an emotion. So some people will use their boss to reaffirm their addiction to judgment. They'll use their enemy to reaffirm their addiction to hatred. They use their friends to reaffirm their addiction to suffering. So now, they need the outer world to feel something. So, to change then is to be greater than your environment, to be greater than the conditions in your world, and the environment is that seductive. So then, why is meditation the tool? Well, let's sit down, let's close our eyes. Let's disconnect from your outer environment. So if you're seeing less things, there's less stimulation going to your brain. If you're playing soft music or you have earplugs in, less sensory information coming to your brain, so you're disconnecting from your environment. If you can sit your body down and tell it to stay like an animal, stay right here, I'm going to feed you when we're done, you can get up and check your emails, you can do all your texts, but right now, you're going to sit there and obey me. So then, when you do that properly, and the, you're not eating anything or smelling anything or tasting anything, you're not up experiencing and feeling anything, you would have to agree with me that you're being defined by a thought, right? So when the body wants to go back to its emotional past, you become aware that your attention is on that emotion, and where you place your attention is where you place your energy. You're siphoning your energy out of the present moment into the past, and you become aware of that, and you settle your body back down in the present moment, because it's saying, well, it's eight o'clock, you normally get upset because you're in traffic around this time, and here you are sitting, and we're used to feeling anger and you're off schedule. Oh, it's 11 o'clock and you usually check your emails and judge everybody. Well, the body's looking for that, that predictable chemical state. And most people, uh, when they have a thought, they just think that that's the truth. And I think one of my greatest realizations in my own journey was just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So if you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and we do, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, and you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, your life's not gonna change very much because the same thought leads to the same choice, the same choice leads to the same behavior, the same behavior creates the same experience, and the same experience produces the same emotion. And so then, the act of becoming conscious of this process to, to begin to become more aware of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. It's called metacognition. And so then, why is that important? Because the more conscious you become of those unconscious states of mind and body, the less likely you're gonna go unconscious during the day. And that thought is not gonna slip by your awareness unchecked because you're, it means to know thyself. And the word meditation means to become familiar with. It's so important. Uh, just like a garden, if you're planting a garden, you got to get rid of the weeds. You got to take the plants from the past year and you got to pull them out. The rocks that sift to the top that are like our emotional blocks, they have to be removed. The soil has to be tenderized and broken down. We have to, we have to make room to plant a new garden. So primarily, we learn the most about ourselves and others when we're uncomfortable. Because the moment you move into that uncomfortable state, normally a program jumps in. When that program jumps in, it's because the person doesn't want to be in the present moment and engage it consciously. And then my final question, what's the impact that you want to have on the world? Uh, I think that the end game for me is to empower people to such a degree that they realize that they need less things outside of them to make them happy. Uh, less things outside of them to regulate their moods and their behaviors and that they begin to use the kind of the power that we all have access to and and to really uh, and to change the world to make a difference so that uh, there's more peace there's more wholeness there's more connection that we support and love each other we serve better uh, and and I think that we have to start uh, for the most part if everybody's working on themselves and uh, and uh, uh, trying, doing their best to present the greatest ideal 
of themselves to the world, uh, I think the world will be a better place. And so uh, that's my passion, and, uh, and I'm witnessing it happening now uh, more than I ever thought I would.